Hello, everybody. This is Megan. And this is Alana. And welcome to Tea Time Crimes. Countdown. Welcome back. Welcome. How you doing, Alana? You are sick again. Yeah, it's been fun for me. I don't oh, get sick sorry. for months, and then I get sick twice in thirty days. So that's Ugh. super I'm sorry. Pooper. Yeah, but you're here. I'm here. Do you still have two feral cats? Don't. <laughs> we hey, got, we uh, got rid of them. They are with one of Chris's rescue friends. So able to find them a, a place permanently or is it a foster situation no i think they're gonna keep them oh nice might be like an indoor outdoor situation because they are very feral mm. so but yeah they were it, it worked out perfectly nice they're still young enough that they might come around yeah definitely they can they, they were teeny it's little you have any business or you want to just hop into that tea review? Because I got a long one for you today. Do I have any business? I don't think I do. Okay. Just what you got for us then? Sniveling. <laughs> sniveling? Okay. Today, sniveling. <laughs> today, I have Evening in Missoula, which is a gift from one of our <gasps> special listeners. Yes. This, this listener was so kind. Yes. Super, super kind. She wrote us an awesome email just telling us how much she loves listening. And then she sent us a gift card for Alana to buy tea to try. Yeah, for Steep Mountain. It's a brand of tea that she loves. So thank you so much. That is awesome. It was really generous. So this one is in their calming line of tea. A naturally sweet Montana-made favorite since the 1970s, this herbal, I don't know how to say this word, Tisane. Tisane, T I S A N E. I've never heard that word before. Did Is you packed... look it up before? No, I like to do everything um, on the show <laughs> for true reactions. <laughs> to Zane, uh, an herbal tea. Okay, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, Is packed with herbs, good for mm-hmm. soothing muscle aches go. and headaches. Um, so it has a ton of herbal goodness in here from chamomile, rose hips. Hips. What a weird <laughs> what a weird thing to name. Rose hips. But yeah. you know, go for it. Uh raspberry leaf, papaya leaf, peppermint spearmint. So this the smell of this tea is so overpowering. Oh it's nice. a like because of the spearmint, you can really smell mm-hmm. it. So I, I actually put it in my office because it makes it smell really nice. Oh, just as yeah, just a potpourri. Like, <laughs> in it's sealed. The ba- the sealed bag, I could smell it really nicely. Wow. Vanilla, star anise. That's good because you're still you you're having oh, trouble smelling today. Yeah, so this tea review is going to be a little interesting. I can only smell or taste for a brief moment when I blow my nose, so Megan's going to have to cut that out. But I'm going to have to mm-hmm. sip, so blow it, leave it in. Nobody wants to hear that. It's gross. I think okay. everybody does. I'm sure there's there some go. weird. Yeah, well, I don't want to give that to them. There's people out there who love the sound of a nose blowing. <laughs> okay, so I'm smelling it. Yeah, if my, it's that my, strong, maybe you can. My smell is dulled, but I can smell the spearmint, which is nuts because I can't really smell anything. Get the spearmint. I do get a little sense of the chamomile, like a more soothing part of it. Mm-hmm. All right. This is going to be a little bit of a magic trick. Ready? I'm ready. <sighs> Ooh, that's nice. Ooh, that's <laughs> nice understand. tea. Okay, I was really nervous about this tea because of how strong it was. Stop laughing. Because of how strongly it smelled, but it's balanced. I didn't realize that you were going to do them simultaneously. I, I, that's, I, what I ha- that's what I have to do. That Otherwise you would blow your nose it. and then take a sip, but you nope. took a sip, held it in your mouth, blew yep. your nose. <laughs> that's how I can do it the best. It has to be that quick. Yeah. That's why I said it was going to be a little bit of a magic trick. 
Sorry. <laughs> so I'm going to do it one more time. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Get rid of everybody. Sip. Nose blow. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. And taste. Ah! Mm. Okay. So there is this. They, they're they right. There is this sweetness. They say it's a naturally sweet <laughs> They're tea. right. They know their own tea. It's amazing. I think. So there's a little bit of vanilla in it. And so. The vanilla uh-huh. and the chamomile blend to create this like lovely bed, like this meadow. Oh. Um, and then the spearmint is kind of like twinkling on top like fireflies. Oh. Where it's like it draws you in and that's what you're expecting. And then you just get surprised by the sweet meadow. Wow. That was one of your better imageries, I have to say. <laughs> well, my brain's not working, so maybe that's the key. <laughs> it's much better than last, last week's chocolate fountain. I thought that was a good one. A synchronized swimming. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I think a, let's take a vote on that one. Gosh, this is really this is really lovely. It's I'm gonna give it a a sweet thumbs up. Oh, okay, I'm gonna give our listener a sweet thumbs up. Thank you, thank you so much, listener. I really appreciate it, and I am so pleasantly surprised by this tea, and so excited to be able to taste it all the time, not yeah. just when I blow my nose. Yeah, I hope you're not gonna do that through the whole podcast. That'll be hard to uh oh no no (laughs) no no. i'll just enjoy the warmth we needed something to call our fans besides listeners i don't know what they would be called i know i was i've been trying to think about that as well as a a motto term as a motto oh i didn't realize we needed a motto yeah i don't know if you have suggestions send them to us because i have a listener suggestion story for today oh at least i think i do to be honest with you I had this on my list already, and then I, I have a memory of you sending me a screenshot of this case, and we neither one of us can locate what source it came in from or who it came from, but I swear somebody sent it to us as well, and I put it on our list. So I think that this is a recommendation. Yeah, we do have many a- avenues where we could get stuff. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, email... <laughs> Messenger. It's hard because you're the one who looks through all those, and since you don't want to know the case, you just take a screenshot without yeah, I don't even text it to me. <laughs> Taking the the words yeah. I'm like oh, so we never case. we never know where she's like I don't know where I got it. I just sent it to you. <laughs> I'm like ah, I lost it. So I think this is a listener recommendation, and thank you. Thank. But this you. is a a long one. Holy moly! This I read three books and a billion articles, and so some of the books I read, I want to just. Say Well, I'll say I'm in the middle because I don't want to give it away for Alana here, but mm-hmm. let's jump into it. Are let's you ready? jump in. I am ready. Okay. I don't think you'll need your earmuffs, but it is one of your oh. least favorite things. The search for Winnie Ruth Judd began on October 19th, 1931, hmm. when two trunks oh, arrived on, come on. on the platform of the Los Angeles Central Station. Oh. One of them leaking a red fluid. Stop. Sorry. It's so gross. Assuming someone was attempting to smuggle venison, the trunks had been tagged at their previous location <laughs> in Phoenix. Well, that's, that's the what, assumption. Oh, that's must be thought. venison. Well, honestly, that they've seen that before, right? They haven't seen what they're about to see. I guess. I don't know what the venison smuggling market is like. In the, in the 30s, it was huge. <laughs> While the baggage clerk waited for someone to come collect the suspicious trunks, Winnie Ruth Judd sat in the ladies' room lounge with a hat box and a brown suitcase that she placed behind the bathroom door. After an hour, the bathroom attendant approached Ruth. She went by Ruth, not Winnie, FYI, oh. hoping she would be catching the next train and kind of clear out of the lounge, you know? Yeah. But Ruth explained that she was waiting for someone. Another hour goes by. Ruth asks the attendant, if she could watch the bags, the hat box, and the brown suitcase while she went in search of her brother. She explained that she'd left word for him to come Mm -mm. and pick her up, but she's been waiting so long, she's afraid he never got the message. Kind of begrudgingly, the attendant says, I'll do my best, you know, I'll keep an eye on it, but, you know, I'm here for a job not to watch your suitcase. And Ruth hurries off. Now, as promised, Ruth returns with her brother, B.J. McKinnell. He's a junior at USC. Oh, They've come to collect all her luggage, including the two trunks on the platform. And McKinnell hands over the baggage claim to the clerk, George Booker. And George knows that they've been tagged 
because of the possible smuggling. And Mm. he goes and gets Arthur Anderson, who's a baggage agent. Now, they're assuming it's deer meat or alcohol because prohibition is also happening. Oh, sure. That's what they're assuming. A baggage agent comes and meets them, Arthur Anderson, like I just mentioned. He asks a few questions. And then Ruth says, yes, they're mine. Her brother doesn't, was just kind of along for the ride. Ruth says they're hers. He says what's in them. And she says books and clothes. And they walk over to the trunks. And as they're walking over, they notice a terrible smell. Uh. Her own brother, McKinnell, is, can't hide his surprise and actually comments on it. And so oh. the odor paired with the liquid oozing out of the Stop. bottom makes Don't it clear that. that it is not just books and clothes. Yeah, no shit. And at this point, the baggage agent truly thinks that something is being smuggled or he's concerned that Ruth will try to file a claim against the company for damaged luggage. I don't think he's oh. thinking that anything worse is happening. Yeah. Probably. He asks her to open the trunks so that they can examine it. And Ruth oh, says, oh, I'll just do it at home. No big deal. And he says, no, I need you to open them now. And no. she says, well, I don't have the key. So my husband has the key. Let me call him. So she call calls him. her husband. Nobody answers. We, yeah, she doesn't have a cell phone. She goes to the office, calls, and nobody answers. So she says, we'll go get the key from my husband and we'll be back. They never came back. Well, four hours later, they're still not back. Yeah. Anderson now has different theories running through his head, and he calls the police around 4.30 p.m. Detective Ryan of the LAPD picks mm. the lock. Oh, wow. Of the trunk that is leaking. And he's a man of the world. He's expecting the worst. And so yeah. he braces himself as he opens the trunk and he kind of flips it open. On the top is just a rug. He moves that. There are books. There are papers. There oh, are they're clothes. Ruined now. There's a blanket. And underneath all of that at the bottom is the body of a dead woman wearing pajamas curled up on her side. Okay, is this a magical trunk? How big is this trunk? I can't understand it. Like, have you seen Harry Potter? No. Never mind. Uh, Well, listeners, the trunk you put Mad-Eye Moody in, that's huge. (laughs) Yeah, it's quite large. I'm getting stuck on something, though. Uh, Of course you are. Lay it on me. Is it her name? No. Is it the time of day? the venison smuggling. Why do they care about it? Why would they stop someone for that? I don't get it. It must have been against the law. So weird. Well, you know how you... Okay, I remember when I moved to California for the first time, they asked me if I had any produce in my car, and I panicked. I panicked. I didn't understand what was happening. Throw the apples out the window. I was from Vermont. I I just immediately said no. (laughs) And then as I'm passing, I thought, oh, my God, I have an apple in here. I've got a plant (laughs) in the trunk. They're going to come get me. Yeah. I don't know the rules. So I'm assuming it's something like that. I got to look it up after this, the venison trade. Or can't trade. cross state lines. Yeah, yeah. look it up in case you ever want to bring venison on one of your trips so that you know the rules. <sighs> hey, I need it. Anyway, so Detective Ryan calls in the homicide and, you know, is waiting for backup. But there are two trunks. So while he's waiting, he picks the lock of the smaller trunk and finds that there's two bundles wrapped in clothing. The first bundle contains a leg from the knee down. Oh, the second bundle contains the head and torso of a That's woman. That's disgusting. Where's the other leg? The remainder of the body would later be found in the luggage Ruth had left in the lady's bathroom tucked behind the door. It's fucking disgusting. Why would you bring that? I mean, I, Although parts of the intestines would never be recovered. Okay. That was Sorry. Not... There you go. So that's, that's where we're at, okay? Setting the just, scene. Okay, the... Huge trunks, the biggest trunks you've ever seen. I don't know. I mean, I could fit into a trunk, a large trunk. I mean, it has to be as big as my desk here for one of them, for I an mean, adult to fit. Steamer in. trunks are very large. Okay. I could curl up in the bottom of a trunk. I guess I'm, yeah, okay. I don't, I think, again, I think that might be the wrong detail to just. I know, but I have on. to imagine it. Okay, well, imagine it's a big ass trunk. Okay. All right. All right. It doesn't take long for police to identify the two victims. They were best friends and roommates, Agnes and Leroy, age mm. 32, although some sources will say that she was in her late 20s. And then Hedvig Sammy Samuelson, oh. who's 27, although some sources also say that she was in her early 20s. 
Now, both of them had been former roommates and very close fa- friends with Ruth Judd. So, what happened? She killed them. Well, Anne Leroy, she goes by Anne, had been born and raised in Oregon, married twice, divorced twice. While attending nursing school, she'd secretly married William Mason, which you may remember from the Jolly Jane episode. When you're a nursing student, you weren't allowed to do anything, not even get a haircut. Uh-huh. So a secret marriage is probably not going to go over probably well. Not. And she was kicked out of school. The marriage didn't last long. And after the marriage was over, William encouraged her to go back to school, which she did. The second time, she was married to a man named Leroy Smith. So I think it's Leroy anyway. It's spelled L-E-R-O-I. For some reason, Anne took his first name as her last name after the divorce, which I believe is pronounced Leroy. Weird. I don't know. It's, it could be Leroy all over, but I think it's Leroy. And it doesn't seem like there was a big story. They just got divorced pretty quickly and nothing terrible happened. They just didn't work out. After that, Anne went to Alaska and continued working as a nurse and became the superintendent at Wrangell General Hospital. Hmm. It's here that Anne met Sammy. Okay. So her first name is Hedvig, but nobody calls her that, Sammy. Sammy had been raised in North Dakota by her parents who were immigrants from uh, Norway. She was a very gifted teacher and applied to teach in Alaska and was picked over like 300 applicants. She'd graduated in 1925 from the school in Minot, where she supported (gasps) herself by working in the cafeteria. Why not Minot? I know. She was active in music, drama, outdoor sports. And after graduating, she spent two years teaching, first in North Dakota, then a year in Montana. And she loved being outdoors, so during the summer, she worked at Yellowstone and at Mount McKinley. I want to do that. Super active. Now, sadly, Sammy contracted a severe case of tuberculosis. Oh, no. And the weather in Alaska (laughs) was not ideal for this. Yeah, not conducive. Because of this, she and Anne decide to move to Phoenix for a better climate and hopefully... Sammy can get back on her feet. Now, some reports say that the people in town liked the women so much that they raised money to pay for their fare to Aww. Phoenix on the Admiral Rogers and also to kind of support Sammy because she wasn't able to work. And so she had a small, meager savings from teaching, but it said that people in town also gave her money to help pad that. That's so sweet. I know. Now, it's in Phoenix that the women first meet Ruth. And Ruth was the only one of the three who was married, which not uncommon, obviously, for those times. But her marriage was not what you might expect, and she was essentially a single woman. She had met Dr. Judd working as an assistant in a psychiatric hospital. She was 18. He was 41. (laughs) They were married in 1924 when Ruth was only 19. Ruth had lived a very sheltered life. Her father was a minister in Indiana. So when she got married and took off with Dr. Judd, it was the first time she'd ever been on a train, first time Mm. she'd ever been away from home, really. And Dr. Judd was sent to Mexico as the on-call doctor for American minors. For three years, Ruth and Dr. Judd are living in Mexico. They said that they were happy, but times were tough because Ruth suffered two miscarriages. And Dr. Judd struggled from a morphine addiction from his time in the Army. Records show that he'd been held in an asylum for a few months at the end of 1919 to treat his addiction, but it was something that he battled the rest of his life. And Dr. Judd had also been married before. In 1920, four years before Ruth, he'd married 17-year-old Lillian Caldwell. Okay. Who passed away weeks after their wedding. Now, Dr. Judd told (gasps) her parents she died of heart disease, but official documents are said to list the cause of death as accidental morphine overdose. (gasps) Is he's a black widow, but a man black widow. What is that? No, called? I think he's just black he's widower. not a black widow. I think he was just a drug addict, and it's oh. very possible that Lillian took morphine as well. By the time Ruth found herself in Arizona, she had to get a job to support her and her husband because Dr. Judd is struggling. He's in and out of work. And when he's out of work, he then goes to other cities to look for work. So he, Ruth's often on her own. Okay. Ruth got a job at the gun row clinic as a medical secretary, but she wasn't actually trained to be a medical secretary, but she needed the job so badly, she took it anyway, and then she started taking classes at night to actually learn how to do her job. Oh, okay. And this is where she met Anne. Anne is a skilled nurse, and Anne also had the foresight to take specialty training for x-rays, and she became an x-ray technician as well. Nice. That's a solid job. Right. So Sammy's still too sick to work, which means Anne 
is splitting her time when they first move there between taking care of Sammy and working part-time when she can to support them. Do you so think the they're s- lovers? At the start, possibly. At the start of 1931, Anne is offered that full-time at the Gunrow Clinic where she meets Ruth and she jumps on it because it's 1931. Think of the times. Yeah, Money's not rolling, especially for two single women. Dust bowl. It's not great. So a full-time job is hard to come by and she's basically supporting Sammy. I mean, Sammy has that meager savings, but Sammy can't work. Yeah, that's rough. And Anne is her full-time caregiver. And this must be really hard. I try to think of it. Sammy sounded like somebody who was super active. I know. She sounded like such a joy for life, wanting to be and embrace the outdoors and be present. That's I can't imagine being bedridden after that. That's what I'm saying. She barely is leaving the house, right? And uh, some of the information I got regarding Sammy, I just want to mention this. It's a book called Sammy and Sonny and the story of Hedvig Samuelson murdered by Winnie Ruth Judd and the story of Sonny Worrell's search for Sammy. So Sammy's, well, you know she's the murderer. (laughs) Sammy, great niece, started writing a book about this and wanted to know more about Sammy. And then sadly, Sonny, the great niece, passed away before she could finish it. And so Sunny's mother, which would be Sammy's niece, yeah. finished it. Oh, it's available sweet. on Kindle. And so a lot of that just shows pictures and just her background yeah. and things like that about her life. Was she tall now, and blonde? Well, I'll get into it. You always you surely try to lead this story. I'll get to their what? appearances. It's next. I said, you always, you always get, oh, were they lovers? Oh, did she look like this? Well, she's from uh, Norway. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Literally, my next line is to give you a picture of these women because it will matter later. Here's what they look like. <laughs> so Ruth is about 5'5", five, five, very slight. She's 110 pounds, high cheekbones, blonde or light brown hair. She's not wealthy, but she's described as giving off an air of elegance. And I'll give you an example. The coat she owned was too small and had shrunk, didn't fit her. So she wore it over her shoulders oh. like a cape and it looked, you know. It looked bougie, but really yeah. it just didn't fit. And I noted this is one example where it's appropriate to wear a cape, not <laughs> any other time. Sammy was tall and slim, bright blue eyes, auburn hair. Hmm. And she's often dressed in silk pajamas because she never really leaves the house. Oh, okay. Both women are described as beautiful. And then Anne is the oldest and appeared to be kind of in charge, the leader of the group. She's 5'6", has a more athletic frame, and is also described as attractive. Now, through Anne, Ruth and Sammy meet. All three women hit it off. Ruth had tuberculosis as a child, and this made her really understand Sammy's struggles. Um. And she worked with Anne, which we know creates a pretty strong bond when you're in the (laughs) trenches. And so Sammy didn't go out much. The three women would play cards. They'd have dinner together. They'd often entertain nurses or doctors from the clinic over at one of their apartments. And Dr. Judd, when he was in town, he would join them as well. But he was gone starting August of 1931. Wasn't around at all. He was in California looking for other work. Oh. At some point along the way, Anne also contracted tuberculosis, but not a severe case. Bro. Still, she needs time to recover. So Ruth brutal. begs the employers to give her some time off, but to hold her job. And the doctors agree. Anne goes home to Oregon to recuperate. When she's gone, though, nobody's able to take care of Sammy. So Sammy moves into a sanitarium oh, to no. make sure she has proper care. Until Those always sound awful Anne can come back. And back in the end day. I know. I think this one was okay. Now, while okay. she waited for everybody to be back together, Ruth actually moved in to Sammy and Anne's apartment because it was a little bit bigger. And they already they already were neighbors. So she moves into their apartment. And when Anne says she's able to come home, Ruth gets Sammy out of the clinic and back into the apartment oh. and starts taking care of her until Anne could get back. And the three women are sharing for a time a one-bedroom apartment. It's tight quarters. <laughs> could you imagine sharing a one-bedroom? <sighs> I feel like a lot of people have to do that these days with housing prices. It's insane. Like, how do you do that? Bunk beds? I guess, or a couch. Yeah. I don't know. Oof. Once Anne's back at work, Ruth moves out to be on her own, and she gets a apartment closer to the work, so she doesn't have to take any public transportation. She can just walk. A lot will be said about this later on because some sources state that this might have been the start of the problems and the fracture in the relationship. Oh, There were letters and, and diary entries written by the women, but from what I can gather, 
It doesn't seem like anything really huge happened. It's just that they all agreed the space was too tight for three people. <laughs> and I get the impression that Anna and Sammy were more bonded than Ruth. Mm. So I think that's always hard, a hard dynamic when you have three, three people. There's usually one who's kind one, of on the, yeah. on the outside. And that's just all it sounded. I'm on the edge. Lady Gaga. <laughs> Perfect. But even, even though they'd moved out, they still have plans to live together later on because Ruth's parents are wanting to possibly move to Phoenix to be closer to her. Oh. And Ruth's hoping that her parents will buy a house big enough that there might be a mother-in-law apartment or yeah. some sort of detached living space where Anne and Sammy could move in and they could all live together again. Now, that's what that's where... That's where they're headed. That's where their backgrounds, that's the scenario. Okay. They're all really good friends. Here's where it starts to take a turn. On the night of October 16th, Ruth was supposed to meet up with 44-year-old Jack Halloran, or Happy Jack, as he was called. Stop. Yep. He was married with a family, and Ruth had met him while working a previous oh, job no. before becoming a medical secretary. Ruth and Jack are having an affair. Good job, guys. But it appears Jack is not exclusive with his mistresses. He, <laughs> what? <laughs> he comes to dinner parties with food, gifts, money, liquor, right? Prohibition. So mm -hmm. the liquor's really cool. I mean, his name's Happy Jack. Come on. Exactly. He's super popular with several women, mm -hmm. including Ann and Sammy. Mm -hmm. But that night, Happy Jack, he doesn't show. So Ruth decides to go over to Anne's instead. She'd been invited over for dinner, but she declined because oh, she... Oh, no. Is you know, he going to be over there? They both had to work in the morning, Anne and Ruth. So she goes over there, and they talk about looking at potential houses the next day, and Ruth changes into some pajamas, sleeps on the couch. By morning, both Anne and Sammy would be dead. What? Shot with a twenty-five caliber pistol. What, what happened? Ruth and Anne were scheduled to work that day. Ruth shows up late. Her hand is bandaged. She works her shift, leaves the office. That's the last anyone saw of her at the clinic. By Sunday, Ruth would be on a train to Los Angeles with two trunks totaling well over 300 pounds. What the fuck happened? And it wasn't because of Happy Jack. This is so confusing. I, you, you're not going to be satisfied at the end of this. It's very confusing. On October 20th, still searching for Ruth, the Los Angeles Evening Express published a timeline of Ruth's movements as they knew at that time. So, Ruth, they haven't found Ruth yet. She's out running around. But here's what they know happened. She boarded this train from Phoenix Sunday night with the help of her landlord and his son to bring the trunks to the station because they are enormous. She arrives in L.A. at 7.45 a.m. The trunks have already been tagged, and we know Ruth went to the ladies' room for a few hours. Around noon, that's when Ruth returns to the station with her brother, and then she leaves again to find her husband. Her brother says that he dropped Ruth off at 5th and Broadway. The police were called that afternoon, and both Ruth's brother and her husband, Dr. Judd, are brought in for questioning. By 11 p.m. that evening, they finally open the hat box and the suitcase left in the ladies' room. Ugh. They find the rest of Sammy's body, as well as a gun. Yeah in a hat box that belonged to Anne. So Anne was the woman in the trunk, and yep. then Sammy was the one that had been cut into four pieces. Stop. An arrest warrant is issued for Ruth. Police are <sighs> sparing no expense for this search. There are officers at every possible transportation. They're at the docks. They're at the train station. I don't know. They're at the rent-a-car. They're everywhere. They're at her brother's house. They're at every hotel. They check uh, like 100 hotels. Wow. The, p the paper also claims that McKinnell, so her brother, admits his sister had fully confessed to him. They're like, that's it. She did it. Whoa. Everybody knows she did it. But the quote they publish is actually this. I don't know why she did it, if she did it. She what? must have been insane. He said that his sister had asked him to drive her to the station to pick up two trunks and throw them in the ocean. Mm. Later, McKinnell would say that he was not quoted correctly and he fully supported his sister. But at the time, he's held in jail as a material witness. Okay. Dr. Judd also backs up his wife. He says she's completely sane. They loved each other. His wife was friends with both women, and he has no idea where she might be or what might have happened. By now, the story that's being pieced together or constructed by the papers is that Anne and Sammy were shot by Ruth in their beds as they slept. What? Then a man, they don't know who, but they mention a playboy wealthy lumberman. That's a quote. I wonder who. 
is wanted for questioning, believed to have helped Jack. dismember and place the bodies in the trunks. Why are we the motive? Doing this? They say it could be rage over drugs, liquor, or the lumberman himself. The Los Angeles Evening Express also reports a story of Anne and Ruth fighting over a cat. Apparently, a cat was ill. One of them wanted to put the cat down. The other one refused and got upset. I guess I I could see myself in that situation. I know. When I read that, I was like, well, a lot of That's money is over that. But I don't – you would just leave the house. You wouldn't – I would with the cat. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I wouldn't shoot people in their sleep. <laughs> Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Like, there'd be like, a really reasonable step before we got there. The man the papers are dancing around is, of course, Happy Jack, who mm-hmm. is mentioned in Sammy's diaries. Oh. They know him. The L.A. papers print his name, but the Phoenix papers redact it because he's well-known and rich. Huh. They just write Mr. and then a line. Classic. Yeah. The motive pieced together over the next few days now becomes that Ruth was having an affair with Jack, and so were Sammy and Anne. Huh. However. Like you mentioned before, rumors are also circulating that maybe the two women were a couple. But yeah. that's not mentioned in 1931. They won't print that not. in the papers. They won't even print the word pregnant. Remember how we had to look up the <laughs> synonyms for pregnant? <laughs> so both things could be true. They could be a couple and they could – Ruth could still be jealous over the attention Jack is giving them. I don't know the answer. But it would have been really helpful to find that out because if, in fact – Anne and Sammy were a loving couple who were devoted to each other, then that motive goes away. And you yeah. think Ruth would know that. But right. they didn't they didn't dig into it. Now Ruth didn't. is still on the run. The papers are absolutely consumed with her. And I've never seen anything like this in all of the cases I've researched. Really? And you've looked at a lot of papers. Every section of the front page is about Winnie Ruth Judd. Wow. So typically when I look up a story, there's a front page article, right? Yeah. That's it. There's not one article. There are several on the Jeez. front page. And then inside, there's more articles. This is why it took me so long. On the 22nd, the headlines in the Los Angeles Evening Express are the following. Food near caves spur hunt for Mrs. Judd. There's an entire article about how Halloran says Ruth was feeling the night of the murders, that she was perfectly happy. An article called Sleuth Ways Murder Clues. This is from a former LAPD chief saying what he thinks has happened to Ruth. Just his guess. Another (laughs) article, police urge brother to save life of suspected slayer. That's an entire article about her brother who is like, I don't know where she is. Wow. Letters bear girls quarrel. These are them reading the letters back Uh and forth that are about the cat and them not living together anymore because the one bedroom's too small. And finally on the front page, Playboy's caresses inflamed fury of Mrs. Judd declares wine party guest. Oh, so some random person says that Ruth was enraged because Happy Jack was paying attention to Sammy or Ann. This is just on the front page. Inside, there's more. Wow. It's unbelievable. Now, anyone who's ever spoken to Ruth is interviewed. She's spotted all over the country, even the world. And late on Friday the 23rd, Ruth Judd surrenders herself to the police and agrees to meet them at a location which happens to be a funeral home. I don't know who picked the location. Seems weird. For five days, she had been on the run. First, she went to a sanitarium where she'd been treated for tuberculosis, and she just slept for two days. Okay. Then she went to a store that she used to work at on Broadway, and she just hid in the store. Okay. Once she surrenders, Dr. Judd hires a lawyer ASAP, and he releases a statement not of insanity, or jealous rage, which is what the papers have been dancing around. But Ruth says of self-defense. Huh. According to Ruth, Sammy pointed a gun at her and shot her in the hand. You'll remember when she arrived to work on Saturday, her hand was said to have been bandaged. Yep. She fought with Sammy as Anne started attacking her with an ironing board. The gun went off, Sammy collapsed, and when Anne kept coming at her, she shot the gun One last time. Now, a bullet is, in fact, in Ruth's hand. Huh. Still. And has become incredibly infected. Yeah, no shit. This is not what anyone was expecting. Can you imagine how painful that would be? Yeah. For days? Yes, that's what I'm saying. If she's telling the truth, then what happened after the fight? Why were there two victims placed in trunks and Sammy cut into four pieces? 
why would you not just call the police? And also, because of her hand, how could Ruth move the bodies? Plus, there was a mattress missing from the apartment. Hmm. She was, as we know, the smallest of the three. Right. And she only has one hand, and she's in extreme pain. So doctors admit that they don't think she could have done that, which really supports to me their earlier theories about an accomplice. But instead of like still going with that, they shift gears into she must have shot herself in the hand to make this story believable. Oh. Which, I mean, maybe, but wow. Good job, guys. Even though Ruth is saying that Happy Jack knows all about what happened that night, but she refuses to give details. And now is the time to talk because this is life or death. Arizona, as you know, yeah. you don't has just set a precedent because they recently executed Eva Dugan, which yep. did not go well. I was just thinking about her. I know, our poor claw-fingered kitty. Now, when the prosecution fails to explain is that in addition to the bullet wound, Ruth also is badly bruised, which she says is from the ironing board and from the fight. The New York Times reports that Ruth was covered in bruises. Really? So which, which is it? Ruth hasn't slept in days. She has a bullet in her hand. It's becoming incredibly infected. I'm sure she hasn't eaten. She's either been in the worst fight of her life or had some sort of break in reality and shot her two best friends. She can't be a stable, healthy woman right now. Yeah. Now, Ruth has to have surgery to remove the bullet. And witnesses are coming out from all corners of, of Phoenix saying that they saw that left hand bandage. They saw the right hand bandage. They saw it bandaged on Saturday. They didn't see it bandaged till Sunday. They saw her without it oh on Saturday. God, what a mess. Because it matters, right? If she didn't have her hand bandaged after the murder, then the self-inflicted theory mm -hmm. would fly. If she had it bandaged right after the murder, then her theory would have more credibility. Now, as the papers wait for the trial to start, they're running every story they can muster up. The Sacramento Union features a criminologist analysis of Ruth's face. I want you to post this picture. Remind me to give it to oh, you. It God. says it's a picture of her face. She's beautiful. She looks like a movie star. It points to her eyebrows and says, eyebrows tend to violence and jealousy. Points to her nose. Sensitive nostrils. What? Points to her mouth. The, the way that it's turned shows that she's dissatisfied. What? It points to her eyes and explains the murder. That's what it says. Eyes explain the murder that because they are far away eyes with vacant expression that's, or vacant stare. That's... Oh. Yeah. Now, after her arrest, a letter is found in the drain of the Broadway store that Ruth hid out in while on the run. It's addressed to Dr. Judd, and it was thought to have possibly been a suicide note because she was contemplating taking her own life. It covers a lot of topics. Oh, my god! It ends with, Dr. Dear, I'm so sorry Sammy shot me. Whether it was the pain or when I got the gun and killed her, it was horrible to pack things as I did. I kept saying, I've got to, I've got to, or I'll be hung. I've got to or I'll be hung. I'm wild with cold, hunger, pain, and fear now. Dr. Darling, if I hadn't got the gun from Sammy, she would have shot me again. Forgive me, not forget me. Whoa. So Dr. Judd stood by his wife as the trial started, and the Daily News quoted him as saying, I have never believed she committed the crime in cold blood. I do not now. She was not in her right mind when it happened, and nobody can convince me to the contrary. This terrible tragedy was forced on her. I have complete faith in her innocence. So self-defense is what he thinks. That's what, he's, she, that's what she's saying. I, I honestly don't know. I'm interested to see what you think by the end. Now, the defense, which is Samuel Franks, Joseph Zaversack, and Paul Schneck, are rumored to have been paid by William Hurst, the famous newspaper publisher, huh. because he's so into this story. Wow. But they did not attempt to prove self-defense. Instead, they went with an insanity plea. Hmm. A very abbreviated summary of the evidence is this. Sammy and Ann lived at 2929 North 2nd Street in Phoenix. A neighbor at 2938 North 2nd Street heard three gunshots Friday night around 1030. No lights were on. Three no people. Okay. Another neighbor heard the same, all three shots within a minute of each other. Huh. Saturday morning, Dr. Frank Atwater heard a woman screaming you know, from the apartment, and then two shots. He said the <gasps> woman was screaming for five to seven minutes. That's a long time. That's too long to not call somebody, in my opinion. 
Saturday morning when Anne didn't show up to work, Mrs. Dunn, which was a wife of a doctor at the clinic, went to check on her. Nobody answered the door. She looked in the bedroom window, saw clothes piled on the bed. She says they were covered in blood. I don't know mm. how you'd know that, though. Would you look at something and be like, well, it's covered in blood? If it's, maybe it was like really covered in blood. Yeah, I guess. If, yeah, if it was really. Saturday at 945, Anne called into work to say she could not make it. That was later known to be Ruth. Oh. Ruth arrives to work at 1010. She's late. Saturday night, the Lightning Delivery Company arrives at 2929 North 2nd Street, so Anne and Sammy's apartment, to pick up a trunk. All the lights are off. Ruth still answers the door and said that because she's moving, she'd shut the power off. Ruth asked to have the trunk taken to the station for the 1040 p.m. train, but the trunk weighed close to 400 pounds and was, they told her it was too heavy. He recommended waiting and using Express in the morning. In the meantime, she asked him to deliver it to her sister's house at 1130 East Brill Street, which is actually her house. Okay. He said neither of her hands were bandaged. That's what he said. What? Patients at the clinic, though, during that whole day, say that her left hand was bandaged. Multiple people? Yeah. Well. Sunday, Ruth and her landlord and his son take the luggage to Union Depot. Now there are two trunks. One weighs in at 235 pounds, another at 90 pounds. They are loaded onto train three, which leaves at 8, 10 p.m. Police find bloodstains in the bathroom, the bedroom, the dining room, and the kitchen. County physician Dr. Maudlin testified that bullet trajectory was down and back with powder burns, which means that it was done at close range. Okay. Sammy had been shot four to five times, once in the hand as a defensive wound. Huh. Anne was shot once in the head. Jesus. A shell was reported as being found in Ruth's apartment in her bedroom under a chair, which was said to be from the same gun. The prosecution's theory here is that Ruth accidentally shot herself in the hand at her own house while cleaning the gun. Now, a mattress is missing from the girl's bedroom. Right. They have two twin beds and a section of the rug. Police assume that there was blood evidence and that Mm -hmm. it was burned, but the rug was actually in the trunk with Anne. That's what the police officer first noticed when he opened it. The mattress was never recovered. One of the trunks belonged to Anne or Sammy and had been stored in the garage. The other was taken from the Judd house. The 25 caliber gun was found in the hat box that Ruth was carrying. And the hat mm-hmm. box belonged to Anne. It had her old monogram on it. And I say old because it was like a previous name, not Anne Leroy. It was an AL. There was also a surgical toolkit that was Dr. Judd's in the hat box. Oh, the ironing board that Ruth said Anne beat her with was put into evidence and then went missing. What? They don't have that for the trial. That's sketch. Yeah. The prosecution argues based on the trajectory of the bullets and the fact that it was Ruth's gun, which she said she kept at the house, at their house, that it was premeditated murder done in a jealous rage. Mm. Ruth is not allowed to testify on her own behalf, and the sole focus is on her mental instability. So her family, the McKinnells, get up and they note genetic components as best they can, aunts and uncles, cousins. Dr. Judd gives a medical history of his wife. You know, I have to, It's this is hard for me because think about the position they're in. Let's say she could very well be struggling from mental illness. That's absolutely possible and would make sense. So they could be telling 100% the truth. But also there could be a world in which the lawyers have said, listen, nobody's going to believe this self-defense story because you're a tiny little woman. They're going to believe that you're insane and then you'll it'll be the easiest way for you to get out of this. And so your family needs to help you, hmm. right? I don't know how much of this is the actual truth. But Dr. Judd, this is what he says. Ruth had tuberculosis when she was a kid and she still suffered from a cough and it kind of made her weak and that's why she was so thin. She became pregnant in 1925, which she was very excited about. She wanted nothing more in the world than to have a child. But due to her health already being poor, it started to decline more as she became Uh, pregnant. Dr. Judd brought her to have an abortion for her own safety. Mm, He said that she agreed to it. But after this was done, she became much worse. She started Uh, having intense mood swings, going from sobbing to laughing yeah. She started speaking of a child as if she'd given birth. Oh, poor she thing. She even named 
this child, Dr. Judd reported Ruth also became scared and would hide in the closet for no reason or no reason that was apparent to him. Dr. Judd also states that he did not allow Ruth to get pregnant due to their financial circumstances providing her birth control, which she pretended to use. Huh. She became pregnant again in 1929 and did not tell Dr. Judd, which makes me question if she really agreed yeah, to the first she's procedure. Yeah, really pushed into it. Instead, she asked if she could go visit his family in California, and she left. Sadly, Ruth had a miscarriage. Mm. The defense had Dr. Edward Huntington Williams testify that Ruth suffered from dementia precox or schizophrenia, should they call call it today. He also said Ruth had a psychopathic personality with psychosis. That mean it means that she she would have breaks from reality. Okay, a psychosis you just have a, a break from reality and would have possible delusions. He's quoted as saying, "She's the type that can cry over a pet's death, but sit calmly by and see loved ones slaughtered without emotion." Whoa, that's what he said. Yeah. Interestingly, he linked mental illness with many tuberculosis patients, huh. and there does seem to be a higher than average. Comorbidity, the Journal of Clinical and Diagnostic Research states that there is a higher than average rate of mental illness with TB patients, including psychosis. Huh. So it could have I been. I wonder if it's causation was, or what. She could have been affected. I, I mean, who knows what the. I, I would be curious to know what her the treatments are for it, what for medication TB. she's taking. Yeah, that's a good point. Ugh. Dr. Clifford Wright agreed with Dr. Williams, and he said that Ruth. This is a quote. She told me she had no feeling whatever about the death of those two girls, that she had no feeling about her connection with it. Yikes. Now, the doctors further attempt to prove that Ruth is not well with all of her past behavior. So Ruth suffered more than one loss of pregnancy. And after that, right, the doctors point to her delusions. She had a child and named it John Robert Judd. Yeah. There was also an incident when she was a teenager where Ruth disappeared for a while. She said she was kidnapped taken from her room, chloroform put over her mouth, and then she escaped naked. She showed up wearing just like a sack, a ba- like a bag. She claimed that she was pregnant by a boy that she was seeing, and he was one of her abductors. Apparently, all of this turned out to be false. Yeah. So she's had some mental illness for a while. Yeah, I'm unclear what happened here. Is this just her first break? Is this just her first right. delusional episode? Or, you said as a teenager, right? Yeah, as a teenager, which is about the age that this stuff kind of has its onset. But also, I think of what the times. It was the 1920s. Was she taken advantage of and tried to make a story to cover up what had happened to her? Or was she a minister's daughter who ran away for the yeah. weekend and made up this elaborate lie? Right. I mean, all of those things are in the realm of possibility for a teenager. Yeah. But it doesn't bode well with the imaginary pregnancy, if that's all true as well. Yeah. The kidnapping incident is referenced in the drain pipe letter that Ruth allegedly wrote to her husband. And here's an excerpt from it. Darling, a confession I've kept from you for life because I was so happy with you and loved you so, why tell you? I am crazy only when I'm very angry or too tired physically, my brain goes wrong. Huh. One obsession I've always had is wanted or saying I had a baby. First, when I was seven years old, I wanted a baby at our house so bad, I told school that mother had one, and for days told the neighbors we had one, and such cute antics it did far and beyond an infant's ability. Then when I was 16, on my birthday, a fellow I was going with and I had split up. I was furious. My girlfriend was the cause. Curiously, I liked her just as well, and we chummed together, but this boy's cousin antagonized me by crowing that someone could take him from me. I had taken her boyfriend months before from her. So there's a lot more that I cut out, but she says. And so finally, so many unmarried girls in that part of the woods were having babies. I conceived of stating I was and and would make this boy marry me if necessary. I was 16. He was 26. He never touched me. I had never had intercourse with him or any man until I met you. So apparently she pretended she was pregnant and was making baby clothes for months. And then she jumped out of her own window, said she was kidnapped, and her plan was to press charges against this man until the girl she was worried about him being with left town because apparently she was moving. And then she would drop the charges. I mean, if he that's a great setup for a relationship if I've ever heard one. 
she apologizes for pretending she was pregnant and had a child with him and that writes about the fight after that. So she seems like she's admitting to that. Yeah. As being a ploy that she had. I would absolutely say. But she also doesn't seem that, it doesn't seem like a delusion. She seems to know she's not pregnant. But it seems more of a con. Uh, it feels like she goes in and out of it. She she realizes that she sometimes has mental breaks and will go into this whole thing. Because she, what did she say? She, her brain goes wrong when she gets angry or tired. Um, yeah. So it seems like she enters episodes and then realizes it uh, maybe afterwards or something like that. Yeah, maybe. And it's, you know, she had tuberculosis as a kid. So if there is some sort of causation there, it would right. be apparent at this time too. Now, obviously the prosecution just brings in their own doctors to say that Ruth is sane. Doctors for the prosecution express Ruth's ability to tell right from wrong and that the guilt she felt over the affair with with uh, Jack Halloran yeah, yikes. points to that. Dr. Catan asked her if she'd ever cut a human being, to which she replied, I have never even cut a chicken. Huh. Because honestly, the self-defense story stopped being really believable based on the way that the bodies were found, particularly Sammy's. And so that's why that piece is so important, because if Ruth didn't do that, who then did? her sto- her self-defense, well, yeah, one, who did? And her self-defense story could possibly be true again. Yeah. This is why everybody's asking about it. So you can guess what the papers are fi- fixating on. Do you want to guess? Um, During the trial, R- Ruth what is... What she looks like? How she's acting? She's, yeah. She's cool and unmoved. <sighs> oh, there we go. You, yeah. Either swooning or you're... Yeah. Uh, you're either a weak a block. baby or you're a ice cold princess. The papers report also that Anne was murdered with a 38 caliber gun, but you'll remember that a 25 caliber gun right. was found on Ruth. Now, this could be a mistake in, on the paper's part, but the book, The Trunk Murderess by Jana Bomberbach, floats a theory that maybe there were two guns and thus two killers. Whoa. Now, Bomberbach talks extensively about her belief that evidence was mishandled. It was assumed that the women were murdered in their beds and that the missing mattress was destroyed because of blood. But she says that both mattresses were missing from the house and a mattress was found abandoned a few miles from the home, but it was never checked or confirmed to see if it was the mattress from the house, which would have been huge because one, there was no blood on that mattress. Two, that would absolutely have meant somebody helped Ruth because Ruth didn't have a car and wouldn't have dragged a mattress two miles. Oh, my God. No. Without help. Second, witnesses say a plumber was called in to check the drains for evidence, which he found, you know, blood and tissue evidence. Yeah. But none of that evidence was mentioned in the trial. Instead, another plumber was called after the first and his report was published, which said that the drains were clean because they were. What? A fingerprint was also found on a blind, a bloody fingerprint, and it was, the tests were never released or it wasn't tested. And people were allowed in and out of the crime scene as well as 10 cents a pop to view Ruth's apartment. What? The landlord was giving tours. Right. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, and the ironing board, like what's happening here? So Bomberbach further reports that the milkman gave a statement that he heard Mm -hmm. someone in the apartment Saturday morning when he made his delivery. He left off the order and left the change. Sunday, he has the same route. The change is gone. Some of the milk is gone as well. By this time, both women are absolutely deceased. Yeah. And according to Ruth and the investigators, she's back at work. Bomberbach raises a lot of questions in her book, and she's one of the few people that Winnie Ruth Judd agreed to speak to directly. Really? Mm-hmm. It's you should you should read the book. So she has she's giving alternate theories all over, but obviously this is this came out after way after the trial. So the the, the jury only has what was presented at trial. On February eighth, nineteen thirty two, the jury deliberated for two hours and forty minutes before returning a verdict of guilty first degree murder, <gasps> and Ruth Judd is sentenced to death by hanging. <gasps> and this is just for the murder of Anne. They did not okay. charge her with the murder of Sammy to start with. Okay. Interesting. And w- think about how Ruth must be feeling. I know she's got a stone f- poker face, but 
everybody knows what happened to Eva Dugan. Yep. That is a terrible it's way to go. And if you terrifying. if you don't know what happened to Eva Dugan, go back and listen to our Eva Dugan episode and find yeah, out. That's a good one. Instead of Googling it. Now, Ruth was transferred to the state prison, and she was the only female inmate on death row, even though she was not the only woman there convicted of murder. So this is unusual. The jurors were vocal after the trial, saying that one of the members of the jury had been insistent that they push for the death penalty because it would force Ruth to tell the whole truth and give up any accomplices she had. That was their strategy. Okay. Because, yeah, I'm like, where's Happy Jack? Happy Jack is in this somewhere. Somebody right? helped her. FYI, hangmen are writing the warden to apply for the job of executing. What the fuck? What is wrong with you? I don't understand the obsession. I would be as far away as executions as possible. Well, you would never be an executioner either. No. I mean, you would be like, I'm all set. I'll mow the lawn. Yeah. Phil <laughs> Hanna promised a painless execution, which honestly is an important point yeah. after what happened to Eva. Yeah, no shit. He said he had a hand-woven rope that he kept in a moisture-proof box. What the fuck? Yeah, I don't... Maybe check that guy out. He has got some bu- skeletons in his closet. Yeah, I don't want to be buds with a man who has a hangman's rope kept in a special box. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's not for me. Mm, I'm going to pass. Now, her new legal team, because her first one was fired after this, is Edward Flanagan and Ovi Wilson. They're hired by the judge immediately, and they file for an appeal. Okay. Request for appeal, they're denied. So, Ruth provides more details to help her case, and she meets with Sheriff McFadden. That's the one who's kind of, she was brought back to Phoenix after being captured in California, and Sheriff McFadden's been overseeing her. She meets with him December of 1932, and she, for the first time, gives a full account of what she says happened. So, this is according to Ruth. Are you ready? Okay. It started on Thursday night. No, it's believed that the murders happened Friday night. Okay. She was with Jack. Ruth was with Jack. And she'd introduced him to a new girl because the new girl was nice and pretty. And she knew the best hunting spots. And Jack wanted to know the best hunting spots. And I assume also wanted to know the pretty girl. So Jack, Ruth, and Lucille, the new girl, meet up. Jack unexpectedly stops at Sammy and Anne's. Ruth doesn't want to go in. She said it's because she didn't want Anne knowing she'd introduced another girl to Jack. Apparently, Jack was doing a lot to supplement Anne's income, oh. and she was afraid Anne would be upset. So Ruth asked Jack not to stop, but he insisted, and then she asked him, well, fine, but don't tell them I'm outside. And she stayed in the car with Lucio. <gasps> but of course he did, and Anne came out anyway. She <gasps> seemed happy to see Ruth, but then she saw Lucille in the back of the car and kind of just went back in. Then Jack went to Ruth's apartment with Lucille and a few other gentlemen for dinner and drinks. Now, Ruth saw Anne the next day at work. No issues. They went out to lunch. Anne invited her over to play bridge with her and Sammy and another acquaintance. Ruth said she had too much work to do, but we know she was expecting Jack to come over. Yeah. When he didn't show, Ruth decided to go over to Anne's after all. Now, Anne sets up the extra bed for Ruth. She gives her some pajamas to borrow. The three women are chatting. Then Anne asks about Lucille. The new girl Ruth had brought and introduced to Jack. Anne knows her because she's treated at the clinic for syphilis. Oh. And Anne is mad that Ruth would introduce a woman with syphilis to Jack. Oh. She wants to know why. Why would she do that? And Ruth says it doesn't matter because she's getting treatment and she thought Lucille was a nice girl. And Anne threatens to tell Jack about the syphilis. And Ruth says, you can't do that. That's confidential information because, you know, she knows it through her medical job. They start calling each other names. It seems that Ruth's relationship with Jack is really the target here. And Anne threatens to tell Dr. Judd about it, which (gasps) is one of Ruth's biggest fears. Yeah, I'm sure. Ruth fights back, threatening to reveal things about Anne, including supporting the rumors that Sam and Annie are together like a woman and a woman. Yes. And also, Anne apparently got mad one time at the clinic because they had started training another person to do x-rays. And so she snuck in the clinic and changed the settings so that it would burn the next person and then that person would 
who was uh, had taken over her job would be blamed. Oh my god! So apparently, Rue threatened with that, and these are big issues. So Anne threatening to expose Ruth for the syphilis introduction. Syphilis carries a terrible social stigma at this time. Penicillin is not being used to treat it just yet. Everybody knows how you get it. It's yeah. really a bad deal. Plus, threatening to tell Dr. Judd. Those are two very serious things in Ruth's mind. On the flip side, if you look from Anne's point of view, Ruth's threats are just as dangerous. Threatening to either lie or expose her relationship with Sammy is also equally as dangerous. Yeah. And also get her fired. Right? I'm I'm a little confused about why maybe I missed something by Anne is upset. Anne's upset. Is she Anne's, worried for uh Ruth's health? Anne's also sleeping with Jack. Yep. There we go. So Anne doesn't want to get syphilis. Okay. Got it. Now it makes sense. At least apparently that's the the theory is that, I mean, okay. we don't know. We, Anne's not here to tell us. Yeah. But that was the theory that Jack was sleeping with both Anne and Sammy. Eek. This guy gets around. Or it could be maybe if Anne wasn't and Sammy, maybe she doesn't want Sammy to get syphilis. I mean. Right. And she's threatening to tell Jack. I, I think also she's afraid that maybe if Jack is supporting them and finds out that Ruth did this, he might just cut all three of them off. Got it. Okay. Now, at the height of the argument, Ruth walked out of the room and into the kitchen. When she turned around, according to Ruth, Sammy had a gun pointed at her. Ruth reached for the gun and grabbed a knife that was on the table. It was a dull knife, though, so it didn't really do anything. Ruth was shot through the hand, and when she tried to attack Sammy with a knife, it just did so little damage. And Sammy did have a couple of small wounds on her body. But Sammy would not let go of the gun. They fought over it. The gun went off. Anne started yelling at Sammy to shoot her, meaning shoot Ruth, and then started hitting Ruth over the head with the ironing board, yelling, I'm going to brain you. Oh, my God. Sammy held on to the gun, and she was shot through the chest. Ruth says she remembers Anne striking her, yeah. Ruth, in the back of the head, and she shot the gun. The next thing she knows, she woke up. Anne had been shot in the head. Sammy was also shot. Both women are dead. She runs home to call Dr. Judd, but Jack was waiting on her doorstep. <gasps> Jack is involved. She, she told him what happened. She's freaking out. He didn't believe her, and he drove her back on, to the house to check. When he got there, he picked up Sammy and put her on Anne's bed, and then he took that mattress away. Ruth says Jack told her that Dr. Brown at the clinic would take care of her hand, but Ruth did not want to go see anybody for her hand. And apparently Jack said he had enough on Dr. Brown to hang him if needed. So Jack helped Anne and Sammy move in so he knew where the trunk was. So according to Ruth, he got the trunk, he put Anne in it, and told Ruth to clean up. She wanted to phone Dr. Judd and confess everything, including the affair, but Jack said he'd take care of everything. And Jack planned to dump the bodies in the desert. He brought Ruth home, told her to wait for him. He calls her the next day at work and says that the desert plan isn't going to work out. Ruth says, I want to go to L.A. I need to see my husband. And, he sh and she'll let him take the bullet out. Jack says, that's a good idea. You also need to take the trunk. Ruth refuses. Jack said, well, we need to meet up and talk about it. They go back to the house that night. Ruth was unsure what would happen. She honestly didn't know if Jack was going to kill her. According to her, it's worth noting also that there are witnesses who can place Jack's car at Sammy and Ann's house okay. over the weekend. Now, when they went in, Jack said Sammy was operated on, which, like I mentioned before, Ew. became a very interesting part of the case because a big reason as to why the self-defense story didn't hold up is because of the fact that Sammy was dismembered. Yeah. And the papers said that she was cut into pieces and they really mm -hmm. played up that angle but she'd actually been cut cleanly into four pieces, which meant it was most likely somebody who had experience. Possibly the Dr. Brown mentioned previously or Jack himself who had worked at a butcher shop. Oh. And apparently he liked to pretend he was a doctor to pick up women. I don't know. I know the skills don't translate. It's hilarious. But it's weird. The book that I mentioned by Jana Bomberbach talks about this a lot. And the author believes that what happened to Sammy is one of the things that made this case most sensational, right? And that made them vilify Ruth. But it seems most likely that Ruth would not have done this part of the crime. That seem, that's a stretch 
for a lot of people to – that was what people were fixated on. Okay. That she would be able to take care of the bodies herself because of her size, because of – even if she didn't have the injury, and then that she would continue to go and cut the bodies. The book covers an account of Dr. Brown coming down to the jail after the verdict. So this isn't in Ruth's confession. This is just afterwards. He came down after the verdict screaming he knew what had happened, and he was very drunk, so they sent him home. Huh. Before his death, he told Ruth he would confess and he'd make an appointment with, he made an appointment with a lawyer. He died a few days later. How? They say heart disease, but there are questions. Poison. Back to Ruth's account. Jack apparently told Ruth to take the overnight train and a man named Williams or Wilson would meet her there. That was on Saturday. But as we know, Ruth took the Sunday train. That's because the trunks were too heavy. Yeah. So she had to take the trunk to her house. Now, she called Jack several times, and he never again took her call. Oh. At this time, there's only one trunk, but two trunks make it to L.A. Right. So when no one would take Ruth's call, she opened the trunk, and she did not like to talk about this. I don't know if, if she had blocked some of it out, but this was really hard for her to talk about. Apparently, she poured some of the contents into one of her own trunks to make the suitcases lighter. She was not very descriptive on how she did it this is also a point where maybe one of the bullet casings fell out into her house oh that's another alternate theory ruth claims she had told this story to her lawyers and had been told that they would call jack halloran to the witness stand and his name was on the list but he was never called okay so up until this story ruth's been denied appeals but with this new information, Sheriff McFadden's like, hey, listen, a grand jury needs to listen to this because it's the most information we've ever gotten from yeah. her. Yeah, and, and Jack we don't is wanna, involved. We don't want to put a woman to death if, in fact, it was self-defense. I think Jack killed him. The grand jury agrees with Ruth that her actions were self-defense, and they recommend her sentence be changed to life in prison. But they also indict Jack Halloran for concealing a crime and aiding a fugitive. All right. Now, in court, Jack makes Ruth lose her cool Every single time. And she wow. just lashes out at him in court and it cuts down her credibility. When she testifies, he'll smirk. He'll laugh. She reacts every time. Sounds like a dick bag. It ended up being that Jack was released. Since the grand jury had ruled Ruth acted in self-defense, there was no crime that Jack could be charged with. But Ruth, her sentence was never officially changed. What? So Jack goes home. Ruth goes to death row. The grand jury cool. recommended that they change the sentence to life instead of uh -huh. death, but that recommendation wasn't taken. Oh. But it was enough to release Jack. That's fucked. So Ruth's still on death row. Her parents move to be near her. They have no money left. At th I don't think they were rich to begin with. They certainly don't have any now. Most of the people are in support of Ruth, and they extend support to her parents. Ministers let them stay with them. People give them free meals at, at their diners or their restaurants or whatever because the judges try to visit their daughter as often as possible. Now, the Arizona Parole Board, they uphold the official ruling. And on March 30th, 1933, despite Sheriff McFadden backing up a lot of the story with the evidence he had found, supported Ruth's self-defense case, yeah. Ruth is still sentenced to hang April 21st. That's wild. Now, after these events, Ruth writes a different confession to her what? attorney. This letter was written in April of 1933. It was not found until 2001. What? How? Yeah. The lawyer had it under lock and key. You can read it in the Arizona Memory Project. The letter paints a very different picture of what happened that night. It's so confusing. This was all so written by Ruth. Oh, man. Psychosis. So Ruth, this is again Ruth's account. And this paints a very different kind of Ruth, a Ruth who is struggling. Now, she says she can't sleep. She's constantly taking pills to help her sleep and calm her nerves, which is was called Luminol at the time. It's a phenobarbital. So negative side effects, according to the National Library of Medicine, include agitation, confusion, nervous system issues, nightmares, psychiatric disturbances, mm -hmm. thinking abnormally, insomnia, hallucinations, anxiety. Okay. It's very possible this was affecting Ruth. Yeah. In this letter, Ruth says Anne is using Jack Halloran for money and taunting Ruth about it. 
The confession huh. makes it seem that Ruth is very, very, very worried that her husband will find out about the affair, and Anne's trying to rub it in Ruth's face every chance she can get. And she becomes obsessed with the thought of going to the apartment with a gun. She writes, Never did I have the slightest dream of hurting Sammy. She simply never entered my mind, except to get Anne, stop those taunts so I could sleep. Nothing more did I think of. I took the gun and a knife. How I would do it, I was not sure, but I had no intention of harming Sammy. Jack was as intimate with Sammy as Anne, but it was Anne's cruel taunts that haunted me. Huh. Ruth says she shot Anne, and then Sammy attacked her and was killed in the struggle. In this letter, she says she then 100% on her own got rid of the bodies, stating that adrenaline what? gave her the strength. She put Anne in the trunk first and then went to work at the clinic. When she got back to the apartment, Sammy's body was too stiff to fit in the trunk, oh, so she cut it into pieces. This is confusing. Now, Dr. Judd will later say that the very in the very first version, Ruth told him that she had cut Sammy in the bathtub. And then after a few weeks, she said she hadn't cut Sammy at all. Also in this letter, Ruth states that she heard the milkman Saturday morning. She stayed quiet, and then she shot Anne, which caused the fight between her and Sammy. Now, if you remember, the milkman said he heard someone early Saturday morning. Yeah. And then that other witness says they heard a woman scream for five to seven minutes. Yeah. So which one is true? Which one has been changed to benefit the latest legal <sighs> strategy? Are either of them the full truth? Are you frozen or thinking? Oh, I didn't know. I thought that was a rhetorical just question. Question. Just waiting the for the just waiting for the audience to write in. I'll just wait for your emails, guys. <laughs> Either way, that that last letter did not come out to the public until the early two thousands. So the first story that she told Sheriff McFadden is what the supporters believe to be true, and the public is mostly in support of Ruth at this point. Letters are coming in, petitions are being signed. Eleanor Roosevelt's in the mix. Huh. However, well, all death row. Go ahead. Didn't she, Eleanor Roosevelt back Georgia Tan? You know, it's not looking great. Yeah. Eleanor, when we look Come at that track record from, from our point of view. But I'm sure there were others that were fine. Arizona law at the time says that a final trial for sanity can be done if the prison warden declares it. In Ruth's case, she'd already been deemed same, so nobody was expecting that to happen. But Warden Walker called for one anyway. April 14th, 1933, the, the sanity trial starts. Now, remember, she's said to be executed on the 21st of April. God. On the 18th, the execution is delayed one week to allow the trial to finish. Preparations are happening for the execution in parallel. Invitations were sent out to 60 people. <sighs> and you can view these invites at the Arizona Memory Project. It reads like a wedding invitation. It's gross. That's weird. You would hate it. The rope to be used is being soaked and stretched to ensure it won't gross. break this time which can take about a week. So again, her family is testifying to her pretending she had a baby brother, her pretending she had a baby on her own, her mood swings, all of that. The prison matron said Ruth would also swing from being aggressive to herself, not to others, but to herself, and then be laughing the next. Yeah. This time, Ruth was ruled insane. April 24th, Ruth was moved to the asylum and she was allowed to bring her cat again, another cat Thank in prison. God. Obviously, nobody knows what happened that night except for the people who were there. But if you're on trial for self-defense and then the bodies have been concealed as they were, one being cut up, you can see how the lawyers might have decided to go with the insanity plea. Yeah. But once they do that, then no one's going to believe what Ruth says because <sighs> she's been deemed insane. Right. But Ruth will say that the lawyers pushed her for the insanity defense because – they said she would just spend a few years in a hospital and then be released to Dr. Judd. Ruth had wanted to go with the self-defense from the start. Okay. Which I, which makes sense to me. I bet yeah. you they did say that. They probably thought that's exactly what would happen. Yep. But her legal team had saved her life, and she's moved to the Arizona State Hospital. And she lived there peacefully for six and a half years, and this is not an easy place to survive. In the 1930s, the care was not great. Shocking. It was overcrowded. The daily budget for patients was less at the hospital than at the prison. <gasps> and Ruth was kind of the exception here. This is a place that's holding people with severe mental illness, with also with disorders that people don't fully understand, like addiction or epilepsy. Uh -huh. Most of the patients are either elderly or very sick. Ugh. Ruth is like young and healthy, essentially. Yeah. 
Now, the book I referenced before by Jana Bomberbach had recollections from Anne Keem, who worked at the hospital. She's quoted as saying, she, meaning Ruth, worked unusually hard, did more for that hospital than any two or three people. She wasn't crazy either. She was as sane as anyone, except when Halloran came out to harass her. Huh. Apparently, Jack would drive out to the hospital and harass Ruth. Get a life. Wait, what? This is so, this case is so messed up. I don't understand yeah, who did what and why well. people did anything. So Ruth has accepted her fate. She's at the hospital. She helps the other patients by making their beds, doing their laundry. She takes care of children in the children's wing. She prepares food for the elderly. She acts as a translator for the hospital because she's fluent in Spanish. She picked it up when she lived in Mexico. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. If they really think she's dangerous, why are they letting her do any of these things? Right. It's an interesting problem. She even starts a little beauty shop within the hospital where she'd fix the patient's hair. Cute. Which is a huge, something they do today. It's like yeah. one of the nicest things, you know, it's a word, cosmetologists will go to nursing homes and it just, you feel so much better when your yep. hair is washed and it looks nice. It does so much for your, for your mental health and your physical health. So in 1934, this is only a year after she's arrived, she claims that representatives from the Department of Corrections visited her and said, listen, if you do a really good job here, we will work on getting you released. Oh. And Ruth kept her end of the bargain. She was involved by helping out the patients. The staff trusted her. Once a week, she was just dropped off at her parents to visit them, and she just came back. Huh. Her little beauty parlor became so successful that people from town started coming in. <laughs> And it became like this thing, like, Winnie Ruth Judd did my hair, right? Wow. This weird yeah. uh, brag. That's strange. And the parole board was like, keep up the good work. You're doing great. And then all, out of nowhere, Ruth was hit for operating without a license, and they closed down her beauty parlor. Because it got too big. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't have let other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All of her privileges were also taken away. That sucks. So around this time, at the same time as her beauty salon gets closed down, Dr. Judd is also supposed to visit. Now, Ruth worked in the hospital earning very small amounts of money, and she sent $20, which was basically most of the cash, to Dr. Judd to visit her. And then she used the rest to buy herself a new dress. She got okay. dressed. She waited. He never came. Aww. So she's got two big blows. Then the governor speaks to Ruth and he's like, listen, I'm sorry about this beauty parlor thing. It's just a political move. People in town who have beauty salons got all up in arms. Like, we're going to get it sorted. Ruth had already waited for five years because they, I remember a year after she'd been there, they'd said, listen, if you just yeah do what you're supposed to do, keep your head down, don't cause any trouble, we're going to work on getting you released. Right. So this was the last straw. On October 24th, 1939, she just walked right out the front door. What? A nurse, who she would never name, had given her a key to the door. Oh. I was like, they can't do that. She kept it hidden in a coin holder under a false lid. No one even knew she had escaped. It was hours before they realized she was gone. <laughs> she had done like a Ferris Bueller. Yeah. Made a dummy out of boxes and soap and bottles, so they thought she was sleeping. That's amazing. Ruth went to see her parents. She wrote a letter to the governor saying like, hey, you know, I want my stuff. Yeah. Then she just hid on the grounds of the hospital, hoping that they would make a deal with her. Six days later, she simply returns and says, well, here I am. <laughs> and she's like, she's a mess. She's sprained her ankle. She's all oh, cut up because she's been living in a field. Now, the papers report that Ruth was incoherent and rambling, insane, but her demands make absolute sense to me. The San Francisco Examiner writes the following. A moment later, however, the temper which caused her to be branded the blonde tigress during her murder oh. trial in 1932 flamed anew, and she demanded her privileges be restored. I want my beauty shop, she shouted. I want to be allowed to walk around the grounds without an attendant, and I want to see my it's mother and not father. not a crazy thing to say at all. Yeah, I would yell too. Those all seem reasonable based off of what she was promised. They later say her story was incoherent and rambling. I'm afraid here, she said. I'm afraid they're going to kill me. Everybody hates me. No one will talk to me now, and I do want people to like me. I have made such a terrible mess of my life, I want to spend the rest of mine making other people happy. Hmm. That doesn't seem incoherent to me. She literally is on death row. I yeah. bet some people don't like her there. She's Because she still has a death sentence, even though she's, been, she's only right. getting a reprieve while she's deemed insane. If she gets better, she goes back on death row. Right. 
She's continued to be quoted as saying, everyone tries to frame me. I was framed at my trial. They told me not to take the stand and I would be set up here for six months and then I would be released. But here I am in this place year after year. Wow. I think that might be accurate. But again, she's in an asylum. So whatever she says is just Mm -hmm. the ramblings of an insane woman. She's not treated well after this escape, and she's kept in solitary for an entire month. Oh, man. That's brutal. When she's released, a nurse said she was going to be executed, so she just walked out again December 3rd, 1939. (laughs) After this escape, she's kept in solitary for two years, not allowed to wear shoes and only given pajamas. No. When she's finally released to the main wing of the hospital, Ruth goes back to helping other patients. A woman named Diane Gales was a child there, which can you imagine how hard that was? Yeah. And she credits Ruth for taking care of her and her sister and giving her a chance. She said she took excellent care of them and was incredibly Mm. kind and loving. I can't believe she didn't break after the two years. I know. That's what I'm saying. I know. It, it, this is tough stuff. Now, in 1947, Ruth's own mother was in the hospital. At first, Mm. Ruth was allowed to provide 24-hour care to her mother. But then, that out of nowhere, that changed one day. They denied Ruth a visit to see her mother on Mother's Day. So she walked out again, May 11th, 1947. (laughs) Oh, that's a big time jump. Yeah. When she, she's been there forever. Past World War II. When she, oh boy. When she returns, access to her mother remains inconsistent. And there's talks of putting Ruth in an entirely different ward altogether. Which really... Makes Ruth mad. So November yeah, 29th, 1951, Ruth climbs out the window of her mother's room by making a <laughs> rope out of rags and yarn. She runs to a nurse's home and gets some food and some clothes. Now, the nurse doesn't realize it's Ruth. She thinks her house has been robbed, so she calls the police. When <laughs> she realizes it's Ruth, she says, oh, I refuse to press charges. Ruth can have anything she wants here. Aww. Because Ruth's, Ruth basically works at the hospital when she's not in solitary. Yeah, essentially. Now, Ruth... You know, she goes back again to the asylum and she just begs them. She says, please just send me to a leper colony so I can help others and connect with other people Mm. who are unwanted. Wow. February 2nd, 1952. Fourth escape. (laughs) This time, friends were believed to have helped her because there was a black car spotted on the grounds. Ruth still had to climb a fence and jump out a three-story window, though. So now friends called the hospital and they tried to make a deal. Ruth would return if she was able to go in front of a grand jury again. At this point, she's been locked up for over 20 years. Right. She's around 50-something, probably. May 11th, 1952, her sentence was commuted to life in prison. This will avoid an execution, but it also opens up the possibility of parole, with which Ruth was told she would get because they were going to count the time in the asylum as time served. Oh, okay. All she needed to do, they told her, was one final sanity hearing. So Ruth agreed, and she waited. That's in May. No hearing was granted. November 27th, 1952, Ruth leaves again. What? Why She's are they ticked. saying... I don't why know. Why are they lying to her? She was out for two days before being captured. That's 1952. Ten years later, October 8th, <laughs> 1962, Ruth escapes again. Wow. She waited a decade for her hearing, and it was never granted. At 56, and after so many escapes... The vibe has changed because the first time Ruth escaped, the headlines were this. The Lancaster New Era paper says, Mad Woman Slayer Flees Hospital. And they recap the murders and they exaggerate them. They say both victims were cut up into tiny pieces and placed in the trunk, okay. which is inaccurate. By this time, they're like, yeah, she's not dangerous. You guys could just keep an eye out and let us know if you see <laughs> her. Thanks. They are just, everybody's like, I mean. Yeah, she's escaped again. Again. And she has not hurt anybody in the last 30 years. Winnie Ruth Judd ceased to exist. She changed her name to Marion Ruth Lane, and she escaped to Oakland, California. Oh. Her, her brother kind of helped her get set up, and Marion Ruth found a job working for the Nichols family in their 23-room home in San Francisco. She goes from an asylum to a mansion, mansion. in San Francisco Bay. Her main job was to care for the matriarch, Mrs. Nichols, and Marion Ruth had a place to live, and she was paid very well. Mrs. Nichols was also extremely generous and would gift Ruth anything she wanted, basically. Ruth said she was afraid to even say that she liked something because Mrs. Nichols would buy it for her instantly. Do they know her past? They did not. She spent all day with Mrs. Nichols and was loved immensely by the entire family. 
She threw tea parties for all of the wealthy millionaire neighbors, and all of the neighbors loved her as well. While she's working for Mrs. Nichols, she also goes back to school, and she graduates when she's 60. What? Now, before Mrs. Nichols dies, because Mrs. Nichols is older than Ruth, she sets Ruth up with a house to live in. Wow. Her daughter, Ethel, and her husband, John, live on a farm, and they build out a guest house to ensure that Ruth will have some place to live after the mother passes on. So when Mrs. Nichols passes away, Mary and Ruth moves to that house at the age of 64. The summer of 1969, the police find Mary and Ruth Lane. Her nephew had been given a car, and it was registered in Mary and Ruth's name. It happened, by coincidence, to be in the vicinity of a murder. Completely unrelated, but they ran the plates. They saw the name. A police officer remembered this was a previous alias that Ruth had used and decided to check the fingerprints anyway. Uh, And she was discovered. Damn. Now, Mrs. Nichols has passed, but her daughter, Ethel, and her husband, John, back Ruth up. They want her released, and they say she can live with them. They say she has employment. They want her released for time served. But before they will agree to release her, the state of Arizona, she technically has to be in prison. You can't be paroled from the asylum. Okay. So her new lawyer, which is paid partly by Ruth, but partly also by Ethel Nichols, gets her deemed sane and put back in jail. The board will meet in October of 1969. This happened in the summer. So she just has to spend like two to three months in jail, and then she's expecting to be paroled. Never happens. The board voted no. Oh. And mandated she spend a full year in prison before she could apply for parole again. So February 1971, there's another hearing. Ethel and John are there supporting her. There's an outpouring of support from people who knew her at the hospital. They go over all the things she did. She cared for the elderly. She cared for the children. Yeah. She did the work of anybody else at the hospital. A Dr. Ben Team and Dr. Collier both agreed there are no signs or symptoms of Ruth's previous diagnosis. Huh. This time the board voted for release. Wow. So Ruth is ready to get her life back, but the governor has to sign the paperwork to make it official. He doesn't sign that until the end of the year, December 22nd, 1971. Brutal. Yeah. So she's officially released just shy now of 39 years served. That's a lot of years. I know. So Mary and Ruth, she kept that name, lived happily working for Ethel until Ethel's death in 1981. Ethel had also made a promise of housing, but it seems that there was some back and forth with the husband. And Mary and Ruth took him to court and received a settlement. Whoa. She lived out her life quietly and peacefully until her death October 23rd, 1998, at the age of 92. Wow. There's so much here. This is crazy. We have odd backgrounds with Ruth pretending to have baby brothers and the kidnapping is weird. Also, I came across this. uh, This is odd. Los Angeles Evening Express published a small excerpt on October 21st during the murder trial. A woman by the name of Ruth Nellie Reinhardt was a Portland nurse and friends of Anne and Sammy. She went missing and was presumed dead after boarding the steamer Princess Louise from Alaska to Portland. Anne was the last person to see her and said she saw her onto the boat. Ruth Reinhardt was 22 years old and it was presumed that she went overboard and she didn't, they didn't even know she was missing until Monday. What? Isn't that weird? That's very odd. It's weird because she's also named Ruth. I know. And it's it's weird that there was like another person that they lost. That's very strange. But, I mean, they, they believe that she was seen on the boat. So what? I just thought that was such a strange coincidence. And to happen, so it happened right before, like the year anniversary hit while the murder trial was going on. Wow. That's wild. Isn't that strange? Something weird with all that. Yeah, so I mean, the theories are this. Ruth was so scared of her husband finding out about the affair that she shot Anne and Sammy in cold blood. That's a possibility. Ruth's self-defense story could be true, but that means Sammy is the one who pointed a gun at her, which seems so out of character for what we've heard about Sammy up to date. Uh, unless Sammy and Anne are together and she's protecting Anne. I could totally see that. the only thing that makes sense to me, too. Or... 
if the, the letter that was discovered is actually the truth in which Anne was shot and she didn't intend to shoot Sammy, but Sammy, seeing Anne yeah. be attacked, then tried to fight uh, and wrestle the gun away from Ruth. That also makes mm-hmm. sense. Were Sam and Anne a couple? Because, like you said, Anne was supposed to have a fiancé in Portland. But I just, I feel like they were. And yeah, it's really I do sad too. They, that... they move together everywhere, too. Like, you don't always see that. Yeah. That makes more sense where you would protect your partner if they were at, and mm-hmm. you know, being harmed. Now, the author... Bomberbach calls attention to the two guns. Remember, this is a 25 caliber and this is a 38. Right. So the gun showed at trial was a 25 caliber. Was was the 38 caliber ever in the mix, or was that just the paper being wrong? And the reason she she kind of came to the conclusion that she does not think that Ruth murdered Anne. She's not even 100 percent sure Ruth did anything. She said all of the evidence supports Ruth's account of what happened to Sammy, but none of it really makes sense for Anne. And she said by the end of her research, she thinks that it's possible Ruth was blackmailed or convinced that she murdered both women when, in fact, she doesn't know if she did. Huh. Now, other rumors circulated that Anne and Sammy were also blackmailers holding knowledge of an abortion business, which is always like everybody's go-to. Yeah. And because Jack paid them a lot, they thought those were the payments because he slept with a lot of women. He didn't pay anybody else, apparently. And okay. they thought when they said, oh, I ha-, he said, I have enough to hang Dr. Brown with. They oh. thought that maybe it was Dr. Brown doing the abortion ring. There was I also see. a nurse at the asylum overheard Ruth talk about one of those women was pregnant. But that was never revealed in the autopsies if that was in fact true or not. <sighs> so if that was the case, if those women were caught up in a black man, I mean, maybe Ruth was also caught up in it. Right. And then... Something happened that night that she wasn't willing to tell the full truth on. I don't know. What do What do you think? I don't know. This is too confusing. Like it's so the fact that like she gave multiple different accounts. She told people different things. She told her. She told. She said at first to um, her husband, right, that she was the one who cut up Sammy, and then she said later she didn't. And so it's just like, what's true? In the drainpipe letter, she said she had to do it. Right. She she had to do it to avoid being killed herself. So I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like self-defense, I that's what I'm leaning towards. But the fact that she tried to cut him up and hide him was not a great move. But that's what I think could happen. But I just yeah. don't know where Jack's involved. I She's not carrying a mattress two miles. No right. one can do she, that. No, that's it's why it's it, it's too bad for for Ruth's sake, but also for Anne and Sammy's sake, that the evidence was not handled better because yeah. somebody murdered those two women, right? And Ruth is saying she did it, but there was somebody else who definitely did something at some point in yeah. there. I th- I think, yeah. I mean, Jack was around. His car was there. Like, yeah, people saw his car there. He's definitely involved. A lot of people think that the second letter that was found later is the closest one to the truth because they think her lawyers read that and thought, oh, shit, I can't do anything with this. This is oh. not going to help us at all. And they lock, and that they just locked it up. Interesting. And that one is interesting because it does go hand in hand with what the milkman said. It does explain the self-defense wounds because her and Sammy would have gotten into a fight. Yep. It does explain why... Sammy was cut up and Anne wasn't because she said rigor mortis had already started to yeah. set in. Gross. I know. Sorry. I so I don't know, but I f- people also overheard after Halloran bragging about how he got away with it when he was drunk because he drank a lot, obviously. Hmm. I don't know. I really, I really, honestly have no idea. Huh. I was more confused by the end of this story than I was at the beginning. Yeah, this is, I don't, I, I really couldn't say with any confidence. And what's so confusing for me is that, I mean, schizophrenia doesn't just go away. By the time, pretty much as soon as Ruth was in the asylum, there are no more reported outbursts. She helped everybody. She worked at the hospital. So was that initial diagnosis accurate? have a hard time believing it was. I'm not saying I don't think that she had a 
psychotic break, but I don't think that she had something that was progressively worse because she got better. That never happens. Right. Without treatment, right? It's not yeah. like she was taking, you know, cutting edge drugs to get better and going through, you know, therapy. She was just stuck in, she, she should have gotten worse. She was stuck in solitary confinement. It still sounds like she had episodes, though. I don't know if it's know. schizophrenia or something. Maybe it's something else. I know. That's why I think it. I think she was maybe misdiagnosed, and I would believe that yeah. maybe something happened. Some maybe something had happened that night. You know, if she, if you believe the most recent letter that was discovered that she c- was obsessing about Anne, taunting her. Uh huh. But I, I don't know. I think there's just something that is not being said, which is so odd because there's they're saying syphilis they're talking about lesbianism in the 1930s they're talking about affairs in the 1930s they're talking about all these things that they don't want to talk about but what really caused i have a hard time believing just and possibly losing her job would be enough for sammy to pull out a gun yeah it's wild i feel like something must have happened yeah i don't know it's, I, there has to be something more yeah Poor Lucille gets dragged through this. <laughs> I know. I'm sure she's fine now. Or dead. Oh, yeah, obviously. The, it's it's really sad. And, and Winnie Ruth Judd agreed to speak to the author that I mentioned, and she she wasn't supposed to talk about it or make any money off of this. That was one of her conditions, and so she didn't want to talk about it with her. She really didn't give her too much more information, but her and the author became friendly. Really? And, yeah. And Interesting. The, I think the author just couldn't possibly believe that the Ruth that she knew would have been capable. And that's what a lot of people said. They said they just, she just seemed so fragile. They never in a million years would have believed huh. that she would have committed the crimes. But again, I don't know. And Sammy and Anne kind of get lost in this big story. Yeah. Yeah. Because everybody obsessed over Ruth. Right. And then the Which papers were sense. full of Ruth, not yeah. really a lot on Sammy. So if you oh, want to read man. more about Sammy, her family wrote that book. It's in the sources. Yeah. Anne's family did not write a book, did the best they could to piece together what Anne was like. And I don't I don't know what happened. Nobody knows what happened. And Ruth didn't want to talk about it ever again. She said it was over and it wasn't going to make a difference. And she spent the rest of her life for Regardless of what happened that night, she certainly spent the rest of her life trying to help other people. Right. God. So I wonder how, uh, what's her name felt when she found out the person working for her was accused of like butchery. Yeah, they totally supported her. I know. That's what, that's what's wild. Like just put yourself in her shoes. Like I know. this person's been working for you and you find out she brutally killed two women. I-, I was trying to put myself in that situation. I was trying to think like, what if you had done that? And I found out. I'll be like, that's not the Alana I know. Yeah. I would still stand by you. So that must have been how sure they were of it. Gotcha. They, Whew. I mean, she went and lived with them for I know. the remainder of I know. Ethel's life. Seems like just a very bad night. I think Ruth's desire to just forget it hid the truth. Yeah, for sure. And we'll never know. But what are your last words? Well, it's not super relevant, but what do the 30s hold for us? Kind of nervous about it, thinking about the oh. 30s and the 1900s. I know we're in the roaring 20s right now, and they right. kind of suck so far. I mean, we, we've, we've been locked in our houses for the yeah. first part of it. Just like the, what was is it? Wasn't it the Spanish flu was in the 20s back then? Mm-hmm. Anyways, so let's see. 30s were, it's always the worst. It's absolutely the worst decade out of all of them. I what? Mean, the 30s? Or the 40s. 30s or 40s are the worst. Oh, great. Well, so the, the 10s next 20 aren't great either. The next 20 years of your life, everybody just jack it in. <laughs> Buckle up. <laughs> were the 1730s that bad? Were I they have any, no idea. Were they any better or worse than the 1760s? I don't know. Who knows? You can say. Radical man. So you're just buying your time till the 2050s? Yep. <laughs> sit tight. I'm going to wait for the worldwide depression in the next decade, yeah. the World Wait's War III for, in the following decade. And, and Medicare. We're here. That's what I'm waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> you nut. 
All right. Well, yeah. Who should who should listen? People who handle evidence. Yeah. Psychologists and psychiatrists, police, judges, and just anyone to do with the prison or asylum institutions. This is a good one to listen to. Can you imagine not wearing shoes? I was trying to imagine what your feet would feel like. I after love not wearing putting... shoes. Oh, I do too. I always go barefoot. But if you haven't put shoes on, I bet it feels really weird. Like, yeah. Okay, I'll give you an sure. example. Every fall, it feels really weird to put jeans on again. Yeah, that's fair. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I'm it's sure that worst. was the least of Ruth's worries, but I just Probably. was thinking about that at the time. Yeah, that's more of a me comment. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening. You can find us on all the platforms at Tea Time Crimes. You can email us at Tea Time Crimes at gmail.com. Please rate, review, like, subscribe, send us yeah. recommendations for teas and crimes because this was a tea recommendation and a crime recommendation. Yeah, you're thank right. You so all in one. Yep, all in one. We will be back next week. Bye bye. Peace out, Amis. <laughs>